Now we would like to begin Dr. Takaki Kajita's lecture. Dr. Atsushi Takeda from the University of Tokyo will act as the moderator of this session. Please welcome Dr. Takeda. Um, thank you for joining to lecture five uh, will be given by Professor Takaki Kajita. Uh, he's a distinguished uh, university professor at uh, University of Tokyo and also a professor at the Institute for Cosmic Ray Research, University of Tokyo. Uh, he awarded a Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015 for the discovery of uh, neutrino oscillation, which shows that neutrinos have mass. The, this award is based on uh, his analysis results presented at the Neutrino International Conference uh, held at uh, Takayama City, Gifu Prefecture, Japan, in 1988. In the conference, uh, the distribution, angular distribution of atmospheric muon neutrino clearly shows uh, neutrino oscillation uh, with uh, uh, great, excellent uh, significance and uh, robust uh, reliability. Of course, uh, taking into account uh, all the possible uh, systematic uncertainties. Okay, um, title of today's uh, his lecture is Discovery of Neutrino Oscillation. If you have uh, any question, uh, please do not hesitate to ask. Okay, then, uh, Professor Ataka Kajita, yeah, could you please start your lecture? Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Well, first of all, I want to say I'm very happy to be able to speak to you. Well, in the last three years, I have been speaking only to my laptop. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to discuss the discovery of neutrino oscillations. Okay, this is the outline. Uh, first, I'll briefly introduce what are neutrinos. Then, uh, before the discovery, I want to discuss the early days of the neutrino studies in Kamioka, that is the location of our experiments. Then I, I want to move on to the discovery of neutrino oscillations, solar neutrino oscillations. And before finishing this talk, I want to briefly discuss my recent research, and I will summarize this talk. Okay, what are neutrinos? Well, certainly I don't want to go to, into two details, but anyway, uh, neutrinos are fundamental particles like electrons and quarks. They are something like electrons without electric charge. In fact, this has, this has a profound impact on the property of neutrinos, neutrinos can easily pass through even the Earth, but they can interact with matter very rarely. Therefore, we are able to study neutrinos. Neutrinos have, like the other particles, three types or three flavors, namely electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. And an important thing historically is neutrinos have been assumed to have no mass. <clears throat> and neutrinos can be uh, detected uh, by this way. A neutrino can interact with a nucleus and then a particle, charged particle is produced, then this particle propagates in the medium 
for example, in water, then in the case of water, uh, Cherenko photons are produced. And of course, uh, we can observe these photons by photo detectors. So this way, we observe neutrino interactions. OK, I want to move on to the early days of the studies. Well, I want to begin the story around 1970s. Around that time, about 50 years ago, Grand Unified Theories of Elementary Particles were pro proposed. Well, this was a very interesting theory. According to the theory, um, strong, weak, and e electromagnetic interactions should be unified at a very high energy scale. And many physicists were excited with the idea. Anyway, this theory predicted that protons should decay with the lifetime of about 10 to 30 years. Well, certainly 10 to 30 years is a very long lifetime, but soon people realized that this is a lifetime that can be measured. And therefore, several proton decay experiments began in the early 80s. And one of them was the Kamiokande experiment. And the sketch of the Kamiokande experiment is shown here. It is a large underground water detector. It had about 60 meters in diameter and 60 meters in height. And it contained 3,000 tons of very clean water. Well, I, a 22-year-old graduate course student, was convinced that Kamiokande must be a very important experiment. So I happily joined this experiment. And let me introduce the location of the Kamiokande experiment. Well, Kamiokande is located there. Well, of course, you know the location of Tokyo. Also, you may know the location of Tsukuba. So compared with these cities, uh, Kamiokande must be located in the mountain area. In fact, it is right. So this is a photo taken about 40 years ago. And the Kamiokande was located in the mountain here. <clears throat> anyway, uh, we had to construct the Kamiokande detector in underground. Therefore, in the spring of 1983, we came to Kamioka to construct the detector. So this photo was taken in the spring of 1983. Well, at that time, Professor Koshiba, who was the leader of this experiment, came to Kamioka to help constructing the detector. So we took this photo. Um, first of all, you notice um, Helmet, work suit, and so on. So clearly, uh, we worked in this kind of way. And in fact, this was the entrance of the mine, deep underground mine. So after taking this photo, we go, went ant into underground to construct the Kamiokande detector. And the actual work in underground to construct the detector was like this. Well, as I said, 
神を噛んで、わざ、ラージディテクター、16メーターインハイト、and we had to install the photo detectors onto the detector wall. And after some discussions, we decided to install the photo detectors onto the detector wall by using these plastic boards. Well, certainly,、um, this was not the ideal working condition. But, well, we thought we were safe. Even if you drop from the 16 meter high, you only drop to the water. So you do not die. So we worked this way for several months. And in fact, I have to say, I enjoyed these works very much. Also, I was excited because I thought that the data from Kamikande may contribute to physics much. Around that time, well, that was the first year PhD course student, I decided to be a physicist. I think I was really lucky to be involved in such an experiment that fit to my interest and work style. <laughs> okay, anyway, the experiment started in July 1983. And of course, We wanted to observe proton decays. However,、um, there are background events to the signals, and the backgrounds are neutrino interactions. And these background neutrinos are created in the atmosphere. Well, cosmic ray particles. Come into the atmosphere and interact with the air nucleus, producing typically pions. And pions are unstable, decay to a muon, and muon is again unstable, decay to an electron. And during this decay chain, neutrinos are created. And these neutrinos, well, most of them simply pass through the earth, but some of them interact in the Kamiokande detector. Therefore, <clears throat> we, we have to understand these background events. <clears throat> okay, now I want to talk about the,、uh, my story around 1986. I received my PhD in March 1986 based on the search for proton decay. Of course, I did not find any evidence for proton decay, but well, it was okay for PhD thesis and I get PhD. <clears throat> However, I failed to get the postdoc job.、Oh, by the way, yesterday, Professor Amano told us that. He was unable to finish the PhD course in three years. Then Professor Akazaki, his mentor, and 2014 Nobel laureate arranged a research associate position for him. Well, in my case, I failed to get the postdoc job. <coughs> Then Professor Koshiba, my mentor, and 2002 Nobel laureate, Somehow arranged a research associate position for me. So, well, I think we, that means Professor Amano and myself, lived in a wonderful time. Well, at this moment, it is simply impossible to get this kind of job without any <laughs> competition. Anyway,、um, in 1986, I still wanted to observe proton decays 
even after my PhD thesis. However, we thought we have to improve the analysis software in order to better separate the proton decay signal and the neutrino background. And for this, we developed new software to improve the proton decay analysis. Well, of course, if you develop a new software, you have to test this software as much as possible. Typically, this software contains many bugs. So, indeed, we did various tests. And as a final test, the neutrino type or neutrino flavor, that is nu e or nu mu, electron neutrino or mu neutrino, was studied for the atom sec neutrino events observed in Kamiokande. Then we found that the number of mu neutrino events was much fewer than expected. Well, this was a test of the software, and the software told us something unexpected. So the immediate conclusion was this software must be something wrong. So we thought that it's very likely that there were some mistakes somewhere in the data analysis or, or software. And therefore, we started various studies to, to find out mistakes. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a typical muon neutrino event observed in Kamiokande. Um, this kind of ring image pattern is observed in Kamiokande. <clears throat> well, we, we indeed worked hard. We worked for about a year, but we didn't find any serious mistake. So after about one year of studies, we concluded that muon neutrino deficit cannot be due to any major problem in the data analysis. So we thought at that point, we should publish our data. So we wrote a paper. This was, in fact, a very simple paper. We essentially, we simply reported the number of muon neutrino events observed and compared with the simulation expectation. And as you can see, data showed a significant deficit compared with the expectation. Also, we counted the number of electron neutrino events. And for electron neutrino events, the data and the expectation agreed reasonably well. That's all we reported. However, the world community, neutrino community, was rather skeptical with this data. People discussed, there must be something wrong in the Kamiokande data. Well, certainly, um, we, we could understand, of course, because we do not understand why the data show such a big deficit. Anyway, although we had no clear idea what was the cause of the deficit, I was most excited with the data. So around that time, I changed my research completely from proton decay searches to neutrino studies to know what was happening in the data in neutrinos. <clears throat> well, when we published this data in 1988, no other experiment gave supporting data. And finally, 
after three years, the IMB experiment, that was another large water Cherenkov detector, also reported the deficit of mu neutrino events. And after that, I think the community people were most, more serious about the possible deficit of mu neutrino events. Anyway, I have to say at that point, still, um, we did not know what was the cause of the deficit. Well, of course, we could imagine possible explanations. And one of them was neutrino oscillations. Well, neutrino oscillation was a phenomenon that was predicted about 60 years ago by theoretical physicists Maki Nakagawa Sakata and independently Ponte Corvo. These people predicted if neutrinos have mass, neutrinos change their type or flavor from one type to the other. For example, muon neutrino could oscillate to tau neutrinos. And here I plotted the muon neutrino survival probability as a function of uh, flight length over energy. And well, okay, so at the starting point, survival probability of mu neutrinos is unity, but at some point it goes down. But if they propagate further, this probability come back to unity, go down, unity, and so on. And when this mu neutrino disappeared, tau neutrinos are appearing. So this is neutrino oscillations. And if this is happening, one can naturally explain the Kamiokande data. However, this was still a possibility to explain the data. One can imagine some other ex explanations to explain the data. So we thought uh, we need to think one step further to really test if the deficit is due to neutrino oscillations or some other, other possibilities. And for this, we thought this way. As I said, neutrinos are created by cosmic ray interactions. <coughs> and therefore, these neutrinos are created in every place in the atmosphere of the Earth and some of them are created above the detector, say 10 to 20 kilometers <coughs> above the detector. And these neutrinos, neutrinos come to the detector after traveling 10 to 20 kilometers, and they may have no time to oscillate. On the other hand, Neutrinos are also created in the other side of the Earth. These neutrinos have to travel very long distance before reaching to the Kamiokande detector, and therefore they may have enough time to oscillate. So if we think this way, we can easily expect that well, we, we can easily conclude that we should observe the up versus down asymmetry of the atmospheric mu neutrinos. However, well, well, okay, that was easy to think. However, the 3,000 ton Kamiokande detector was too small to observe this effect. We needed much larger detector, and that was Super Kamiokande. Okay, I want to move on to the discovery of neutrino oscillations. <laughs> well, certainly Super Kamiokande is much larger than Kamiokande. It is a 50,000 ton 
water Cherenkov detector. Uh, by the way, this is an international collaboration. We have about 230 people from 11 countries. <clears throat> anyway, um, in the last year of the construction, our collaborators came to Kamioka Underground to construct the Super Kamioka Detector. And this photo shows the construction of the Super Kamioka Detector. In 1995, um, these many people every day came to Kamioka to construct a detector. And I want to tell you that about, say, hmm, 70 to 80% of them, maybe 80%, are physicists. So Super Kamioka and their collaboration worked in underground. <clears throat> anyway, the construction was successful. And in January 96, we started filling pure water into the Super Kamioka and the tank. And this photo was taken while we filled Super Kamiokande with pure water. And the experiment started from April 96. And from the early days of the operation, uh, we observed this kind of atmospheric neutrino interactions. You can see this kind of ring image. <laughs> in Super Kamiokande, uh, this kind of events are observed every day, about 10 Newton events a day. And many collaborators studied this event as a team. In fact, I think we really worked hard in, the, uh, in this period. And in two years, we were able to report our first important result. And that was the um, announcement of the evidence for neutrino oscillations in 1998. And here, I copied the slide we used in the neutrino conference 98. And maybe young people have no idea what does this um, slide mean? Well, nowadays, of course, we use PowerPoint. However, in the 20th century, we didn't have PowerPoint. So we used this plastic film. Anyway, well, let me explain what we showed. Um, this is the uh, uh, neutrino arrival distribution for muon neutrinos. And cosine theta one means downgoing neutrinos, minus one means upward going neutrinos coming from the other side of the earth. And these black dots with error bars shows the data, and the hatched histogram shows the Monte Carlo prediction. And you see, for downgoing neutrinos, the data and Monte Carlo prediction agreed quite well. However, for upward going neutrinos, data showed almost a factor of two deficit. And this can be explained very well if we include neutrino oscillations, namely neutrinos coming from the other side of the Earth, oscillate before reaching to the super Kamiokande detector. So, well, at that point, the world community was convinced that neutrinos oscillate. Well, we were happy. Now, well, I want to say we are more than happy to hear the um, remark by President Clinton at MIT's 1998 commencement. Um, in that talk, he mentioned the discovery of neutrino oscillations. Well, of course, this is a 30 minutes talk, so let me just simply report what he mentioned about 
supercomputer result in, in this talk. He said, just yesterday in Japan, physicists announced a discovery that tiny neutrinos have mass. Now, that may not mean much to most Americans, but it may change our most fundamental theories from the nature of the smallest subatomic particles to how the universe itself works and indeed how it expands. Of course, as the US president, he mentioned in Super Kamiokande, there is a big contribution from US. But then he came back and he said, the larger issue is that these kinds of findings have implications that are not limited to the laboratory. They affect the whole of society, not only our economy, but our very view of life, our understanding of our relations with others, and our place in time. So, we were really, really very happy to hear this kind of remark by the US president. On the next day, of the announcement. Now, I want to briefly discuss the second discovery of neutrino oscillations, that is solar neutrino oscillations. Well, first of all, let me uh, remind you that the sun generates energy by nuclear fusion processes and neutrinos are created by these processes. Therefore, the observation of solar neutrino is very important to understand the energy generation mechanism in the sun. And therefore, the pioneering Homestake experiment observed solar neutrinos for the first time. However, the observed event rate was only about one third of the prediction. This was in the late 60s. Then the subsequent solar neutron experiments were successful in observing solar neutrinos, but they also confirmed the solar neutrino deficit. But anyway, the solar neutrino problem was not solved during the 20th century. Then, a very important experiment to understand the solar neutrino problem was the snow experiment. It was, um, again, a very deep underground detector. And this is the uh, image of the snow detector. And in fact, this detector contains 1,000 tons of very clean, heavy water. Why heavy water? In fact, heavy water is very important because um, with heavy water, the snow experiment can observe the total neutrino flux independent of the neutrino flavor or neutrino type. In addition, snow experiment can observe the electron neutrino flux. And the result is shown here. If they observe the total neutrino flux, the observed event rate was just as expected. However, if they observe the electron neutrino flux only, the observed flux was about one third of the prediction. Since, so, since the sun can generate only electron neutrinos, so the deficit of the electron neutrino flux clearly indicates neutrino oscillations. That means electron neutrinos, neutrinos oscillate to other neutrinos. So this way, um, solar neutrino problem was understood to be due to neutrino oscillation. Ah, by the way, Super Kamiokande also contribute a little bit in this, uh, in, uh, in understanding the solar neutrino problem. <clears throat> now, you may ask, why neutrino mass is so important? Why President Clinton mentioned 
the discovery of neutrino oscillations in his speech. Well, let me convince you that neutrino mass is very important. Here, I, I show the mass of charged leptons and quarks. These are elementary particles, and the mass of these charged leptons and quarks are shown here. Now, after, the, after 25 years of the discovery of neutrino oscillations, we much better understood the neutrino mass themselves. And let me plot the neutrino mass. It is here. So, you find the neutrino mass is plotted in a very different place in this uh, plot. And you have to be careful that one unit is two orders of magnitude. So, the neutrino mass is approximately, or maybe more than 10 orders of magnitude, smaller than the corresponding mass of quarks and charged leptons. 10 orders of magnitude smaller. Very small. And we believe that this is the key to better understand elementary particles and the universe. Therefore, the neutrino community was really excited with the neutrino mass. <clears throat> and well, since the discovery of neutrino oscillations, these many experiments, neutrino experiments, have been studied neutrino oscillations in very detail. So first of all, you notice there are many experiments. And furthermore, I have to say that there are still more to come. So really, the world neutrino community is really excited with the discovery of neutrino mass. OK, um, before finishing this talk, I briefly want to discuss my recent research. <clears throat> Actually, from now on, I want to briefly discuss uh, gravitational waves. Um, well, let me talk about the history, my research history, around 2008. In April 2008, I became the director of the Institute for Cosmic Ray Research. And at that point, I was no more able to spend substantial time to my research. That was the study of atom sec neutrinos and neutrino oscillations. At the same time, as a scientist, I wanted to begin something new and exciting with my partial time. Well, certainly, I worked on atom sec neutrino studies for more than 20 years, which was a little bit too long. In our institute, gravitational wave project was selected for many years as the main project, main future project of the institute. In addition, of course, gravitational waves have the fundamental importance in understanding the gravity and universe. So I decided to join and help the Kagura Gravitational Wave Project. OK, so this is the sketch of the Kagura laser interferometer. It is a 3 kilometer by 3 kilometer laser interferometer located in deep underground. Oh. Well, why, you may ask why you locate deep underground. Well, in these detectors, the seismic noises are a serious background. And if you go underground, the seismic noises are reduced substantially. Therefore, we decided to go underground. And the project was approved in 2010. Then, of course, you may know that in 2015, September 2015, the LIGO detector, detectors observed 
uh, this gravitational wave. And the discovery of the gravitational wave was announced in February 2016, and then 2017, these three people received the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of gravitational waves. Anyway, we think with this discovery, we entered into a new era in astronomy, gravitational wave astronomy. So our excitement is continuing. <laughs> um, well, let me introduce the Kagura, pro uh, Kagura detector. As I said, uh, Kagura has three kilometer uh, arm length, and this is a photo of the three kilometer vacuum tube. And the central area is much more complicated comp compared with the uh, three kilometer long vacuum tube. So this is the central area. There are many vacuum tanks and so on. And this is the uh, uh, mirror, main, one of the main mirrors used in Kagura. This is a sapphire mirror, 22 centimeter in diameter, 15 centimeter in thickness. The weight is 23 kilograms. And after the preparation of this mirror, uh, the, this mirror is uh, installed into one of the um, <clears throat> cryostat in Kagura laser interferometer. <clears throat> well, okay, now I have to say we, we are now entering into the uh, gravitational wave astronomy, astronomy era, and to do astronomy, um, we have to measure the signal arrival direction, and in order to do so, we have to collaborate worldwide uh, because, well, any single interferometer, even if they, they could measure the uh, gravitational wave signal, uh, they cannot tell the signal arrival direction. The signal arrival direction can only be um, measured if we have the, if we, we combine all these data, because we can measure the time difference of the signal arrival, and this way um, we measure the signal arrival direction. And therefore, the scientific output will be maximized by the global gravitational wave network, and Kagura will start observation in the gra gravitational wave network with Drago and Virgo most probably from May this year. So, we are really excited now. Okay, let me summarize. Atomic muon neutrino deficit was observed unexpectedly by protonic experiments. Subsequently, in 1998, Super Kamiokande discovered neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. The discovery of non-zero neutrino mass opened a window to study physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. And neutrinos with small mass might also be the key to understand the fundamental question of the universe. And I feel that I was very fortunate. I had very good advisors, colleagues, and I was involved in very good scientific project. So my final message is, if we, if we work hard and are lucky, nature will kindly tell us the secret of it. OK, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your yeah. <clears throat> lecture. And now, yeah, we are in a uh, question and answer session. And uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand. Do not hesitate to ask. Okay, please. 
Uh, hello, uh, I am Muslim from Turkey. Uh, thank you so much for uh, this talk. Uh, I have a one question. I know this is a uh, so early stage of the, the, the uh, study in the nutrients, but uh, is there any like, uh, do you have, is it fitted the uh, quantum mechanics, uh, the, the properties of the, this, you know, like the nutrients fit the quantum mechanics uh, equations? like Schrodinger equation or other probability or uh, equation or something like that. Do you have like uh, any uh, idea on that? I, I am not sure is there any study on that or not. Quantum mechanics means um, in order to explain neutrino oscillations, the, do we need quantum mechanics or uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I may not be understanding your question well. So yes, this kind of, you know, like the particles, do you think, uh, is it fit the quantum mechanics, like the electrons or photons? Or maybe it will be showed another, you know, like the mechanism, you know, like the, uh, after Newton, you know, like the quantum mechanics came in the 20th centuries. But this kind of particle, do you think it will be show maybe another, like the, the mechanism or something like that? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, okay, um, the neutrino oscillation was predicted essentially based on quantum mechanics. And all the data so far are well explained by, uh, um, by a framework of neutrino oscillations assuming quantum mechanics. And in this sense, um, our data, global data, are just consistent with quantum mechanics. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Oh, okay. Thank you so much for a very nice talk. Um, I'm from New Zealand. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that uh, neutrinos uh, pass through everything. And at the end, it confirmed that it has mass. I'm not a physician. I'm just wondering if the neutrin neutrinos pass through everything and has mass, and if it passes through our body, does it have any effect on the for example, body, like ionizing the body or this sort of stuff, yeah? Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, uh, first of all, okay. Um, well, a very small fraction of these neutrinos interact somewhere in the matter, and the interaction probability essentially does not depend on the, um, on the mass of neutrinos. And well, also in addition, um, the interaction kinematics are, is also essentially independent of the neutrino mass. In that sense, um, even if neutrinos have mass, um, there's no effect other than neutrino oscillations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, hi, professors. Um, I, I'm a a, a med medical student from China, so I uh, didn't know much about physics. But uh, in your uh, literatures, I know that there are uh, you introduce some types of neutrinos, and uh, you say that they have mass. But uh, I want to know uh, which type of neutrinos uh, has the um, a large mass, or another neutrinos have a less ma uh, mass. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, so I'm very sorry. I didn't go into detail of the uh, neutrino oscillation equation. 
In fact, um, by new gene oscillations, um, we can measure the neutrino mass difference, uh, new, new, well, more exactly, neutrino mass square difference. And therefore, uh, now, we fairly well understand the heaviest neutrino mass and the second heaviest neutrino mass. Unfortunately, uh, essentially, we have no idea what will be the lightest neutrino mass. Thanks, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor, for an interesting talk. I am Lebo from South Africa. So I read with interest the speech from the president of the USA that you presented. Thank you for that. I have a question now. I'm not a physicist, so... Um, what does this research that you're doing, the one that you've done in the past and the new one that you are busy with, what does it mean for the society at large? For me now, just as a person who, who is interested, what does it mean for me? How can it be applied? Thank you. No, I, I, I'm sorry. Maybe I, I do not understand completely. So you are talking yes, about uh, this... Yes, your presentation uh, and the work that you have done in the past that was commended by the president of the U.S. and what you are busy with, how does it affect our lives? How yes. does it affect okay. our life? Yes, how, what can it be used for? Well, okay, thank you. Well, okay. I, I think um, neutrino mass will not affect our life at least for the moment. Maybe 100 years later, 200 years later, maybe there are some different, the Newton mass could be some relevance to our daily life, but at present, we have no idea. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Um, I'm Tabitha from Kenya. Thank you so much, Prof, for the presentation. My question is very simple. Do you see us getting to a point where we'll have uh, neutrino sources being applied in, in, in experiments? Like you see, we have these electron sources, we have neutron sources that we use to carry out some type of experiments. Can we have neutrino being used in such cases as well? Do you see us getting there, or are we there? Oh, thank you. If you are talking about the experiments using neutrinos, right? Well, certainly, uh, um, I think uh, we have various ways to use neutrinos to study, say, new, new, say, particles, particle physics, nuclear physics. Uh, in, in that sense, neutrinos are very useful. I, am I answering to your question? Yes, you're answering my question. But apart from the, the specialized field of particle physics, can we apply it um, in the other areas? Like you can have neutron sources that are very useful in yeah, studying. Yeah, okay, other I understand. Stuff. Thank you. Well, if you have any idea, I encourage you to pursue this possibility. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have any good idea to use neutrinos for these um, applications. Thank you. Okay, now time is almost full. The next is our last question. And, uh... Okay, so Professor, so thanks for your presentation. Actually, uh, my name is Zheng Xiaoya. I'm from China, and currently I'm doing my PhD at the University of Tsukuba. 
So I've got a question. So it seems like the currently the smallest or the lightest particle is neutrino. Is it right? Hmm? Currently, the lightest or smallest particle is neutrino. Is it right? Neutrinos are uh, the lightest particle? Yes. So, uh, well, okay. Photons have no mass. In that sense, photons are lighter than neutrinos. So do you think is there any other particles that is lighter than neutrinos? Okay. Um, uh, Hmm, okay, good question. Well, uh, we assume uh, gluon that bind quarks to form protons. Gluons are assumed to be massless, but experimentally, uh, I, I, I think our constraint on the gluon mass is not so stringent compared with the neutrino mass. But anyway, uh, people generally believe that gluons are massless. Also, uh, graviton, gravity, uh, are assumed to be massless. So there are several massless particles. So uh, like uh, using current technologies, do you think is it possible to measure its weight? Uh, For, for gluons, uh, I have no idea how we can measure the gluon mass. Um, for gravity, uh, since we do not observe any um, exponential part in the strength of the gravity, from that, uh, we ex I expect that we could constrain the graviton mass. But, well, I, I'm not an expert on this, on, on this topic. Thank you for your question. Maybe later I will Google it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, several good questions. Now time is up. Then, yeah, let's thanks to Professor Kajita again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kajita and Dr. Takeda. Let us show our appreciation with another round of applause.